Dr. Townsell, let's talk about your recent book published in 2021, the title of which is Chosen Peoples, Christianity and Political Imagination in South Sudan. I want to hear about this book, and maybe I'll get you started with this question. Why do you say political imagination? Absolutely. Um, So Chosen Peoples is really about the ways in which people within South Sudan, both, you know, lay people, ordained men, women, literate, illiterate, right, approached Judeo-Christian scriptures, right, the Old and New Testaments, to kind of provide them a vocabulary of resistance against the Sudanese state, right, people who kind of mined Christian scriptures to kind of say, hey, our, you know, fight for freedom and liberation is divinely sanctioned. And so by political imagination, I'm really talking about people who didn't necessarily read the Bible in a partisan way, but read it politically, right? People who Interesting. understood that to identify as a Christian publicly in this particular post-colonial Sudanese context means something that is very political, right? It doesn't just mean that I attend church on Sunday, that, you know, I don't pray five times a day. It means that I am in a kind of existential, um, irreconcilable conflict against a regime that wants to publicly frame itself as an Islamic state and is willing to do so to the lengths of closing down Christian schools, um, you know, violent forced conversions. Um, And so by political imagination, I'm really talking about um, a kind of very political way of what it meant to imagine someone as someone who was a child of God, right? To say that I am particularly beloved of God. And because of that, I have a kind of providential um, sponsorship behind my political cause. So how far back in history does this profound belief, this sense of distinction from the rest of Sudan go? Is this like a 20th century thing or do we... Yes, um, it is a 20th century phenomenon. Um, so the book really starts right after the British established hegemony in Sudan in the late 1800s. Um, in a similar way that Egypt was known to have a kind of hegemonic role in the Sudan, we know that historically northern Sudanese tended to raid the margins of Sudan both to the west in places like Darfur, but also way further down south into Central Africa for enslaved people. Right? Wow, that's far. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so during the colonial period within the Sudan, most of the colonial power was headquartered in the north, in Khartoum. So Khartoum was like the, you know, Washington, D.C., if you will, yeah. of the colonial Sudanese state, right? That's where most of the infrastructure was. That's where the best schools were. That's where the elites could get white collar jobs, right? Meanwhile, hundreds of miles down south, the colonial administration basically um, delegated educational responsibilities to lower funded Christian missionaries. Right. So basically someone in, you know, it it would almost be akin to if we think about in the U.S. context, you know, the person growing up in 1920s Mississippi who lives way out in the boondocks and the, you know, types of schools that may have been out there compared to those in town. Right. This kind of town and country. Yeah. um, Yeah. Divide. Right. And so. Over the course of the colonial period, Northern Sudanese enjoyed certain social and economic advantages politically over their South Sudanese counterparts. Um, And this breeds a lot of 
resentment, right? And a lot of fear by the mid 1950s among South Sudanese that once Sudan becomes independent, these Northern Sudanese Muslims are going to be in power and are going to try to basically hoard national power amongst themselves while we black, relatively poor, relatively less educated, but Christian South Sudanese are going to be at the margins. Wow. Um, let me digest that for a second. Going sure, back sure. to the early 20th century, mm -hmm. late 1800s, late 19th century. So by what you just described, if Christian missionaries were sort of invited, hey, go to the to South Sudan, southern parts of the Sudan, and mm -hmm. you take care of the education. We're not interested. We want to create administrators up in Khartoum. Exactly. So missionaries have sort of a free hand to also create a distinct culture that is welcome for many different reasons, practical, education, and perhaps administrative, and also religious kinship between them as Christian missionaries and Christian South Sudan. So a separate culture is reinforced in South Sudan. Is that correct? Exactly. And this culture, ah. I mean, it's crazy what the what the colonial administration literally does in 1930 is to enact what has been known as the Southern policy. And the Southern policy set in motion legally prohibitions where Southerners and Northerners could not freely travel between North and South without permission, right? And so they really try to create within the South a kind of separate administrative structure, right? Um, these, but, but wait a minute, uh, if I may interrupt you, please. Uh, sure. You said 1930, I think. Um, in 1930, Sudan was still part of the British Empire. Exactly. So the British are doing this. They're actually creating two distinct uh, administrative areas. Yes. And the reason why, right? And this is where kind of, I think, um, religious uh, politics sometimes hides in plain sight. There was concern among the British administration that Islam had to be, quote unquote, contained, right? That Islam had, an, you know, an almost thousand year history in northern Sudan but had a very small presence in Southern Sudan. And so they were very keen oh, on wow. basically artificially containing, you know, the Muslim demographic within Northern Sudan, right? So what they do is say, look, this is a single Sudanese colony, but we're really going to kind of create within Southern Sudan a kind of buffer zone, right? <laughs> so that places like Kenya and Uganda, you know, and Tanzania can be quote unquote protected from Islam. And it's so crazy. I mean, yeah. that that sows the seeds of the separation in 2000. Exactly. Exactly. Because then after World War II, right, when the kind of, you know, um the avalanche of decolonization begins and it's clear yeah. that you know this thing called colonialism is now no longer going to be accepted because we just fought this war against you know nazism and fascism and stuff um and so when in 1947 there is a conference and it is decided that when sudan someday one day becomes independent it's not going to be as two two countries, right? It's not going to be as Northern Sudan and South Sudan, but it's going to be as one Sudanese state ruled from the North in Khartoum. You have a lot of Southerners as early as the 1940s beginning to be like, we're not down with this, right? <laughs> we, we are yeah. a separate people from the North. And by 1955, right, you have revolution within the south which really sets the tone for the next 50 years for the 
um, wow. the very bloody civil wars which would ensue. Uh, going back to independence of Sudan from British uh, uh, Empire. Uh, what year did that take place? 1950? So uh, on January the 1st, 1956. Yeah. Okay, 1956. Uh, you talk about, earlier you mentioned uh, how South Sudanese feared that North Sudanese would uh, force conversion, they would shut down uh, Christian schools. Did that happen, actually? It did. Oh, wow. Um, and so, so post-independence. Post yes. So after Sudan becomes independent in 1956, you have a series of policies, you know, collectively known as Arabization and Islamization. And what this practically looked like on the ground was the government saying, look, we're going to have a single educational system. And so therefore, schools that used to be missionary schools are now going to be public schools. Right? Yeah. Um, the language that will now be instructed from the elementary level up is going to be Arabic. Right? And Quran, or sorry, the Quran is going to be the kind of, you know, textbook. Right? Right? Um, practically speaking, there was a protest after Friday replaced to Sunday as the weekly holiday, right? Yeah, Friday so is the day of prayer in Islam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, right? So it was in kind of the strategy was in some ways, I think, very, um, what word am I trying to, it was very much done in a way that did not appear overtly violent, right? So it did not start with, you know, armed soldiers burning churches and things like that, right? It was yeah, yeah. much more of an administrative policy, right? They were the subtly thing, chipping away exactly. at their freedom and suppressing their ways of life and creed. Exactly. Which, which, um, oh, uh, oh, um, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Did you have a follow up? Oh. Yeah, the, the kind of one step that really ignited the conflagration was when in 1964, the Sudanese government expelled 300 foreign missionaries from the country. And so this got, you know, world headlines and things yeah. like that. Um, and so, yeah. All of this sort of all of this discussion about South Sudan and its administrative uh, separation from nor northern parts of Sudan, sort of all this conversation converges into the following question that now that South Sudan is a Christian nation and everyone, uh, I suppose everyone is Christian. Is yeah, it's about, yeah, it's a, it's the single largest faith group. Um, over 60% of the country identifies as Christian. Yep. 60%. Okay. So it's not like 85% or 90%. But anyway, no, no, no. now that is dominantly Christian, is everything fine? Is it going well? Ooh, great question. <laughs> <laughs> and my I, mean, I, had that, is, to ask, I had to ask that question. We, yeah. we led up to it no, uh, in all of our conversation. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I'll answer it in this way. Um, I don't know if you've seen the Ridley Scott movie Exodus Gods and Kings, which no, is I have not. His, yes. So it's his kind of Hollywood adaptation of the Exodus um story and so there is this one scene in the movie which i think perfectly maps on to your question in terms of how are things in south sudan now right that it's yeah. independent that it's a majority christian country that they no longer have to you know worry about you know religious discrimination right there's this scene where right after the children of israel have crossed the red sea right they're no longer in egypt they're now free in Canaan, right, where Joshua and Moses are talking. And Joshua's like, look, you know, we're this huge band of tribes. Like, we're God's chosen people. We're good now. 
And then Moses looks at him and says, but what happens when we stop running? Right. And I think that this is the <laughs> the existential question that South Sudan has had since it became its own independent state, right? The world's newest state in 2011, which is to say that for 50 years, the national project was built upon liberation from the North, right? So long as we can create our own independent South Sudan, right? That was the kind of binding glue, right? But once it became independence in 2011, it highlighted the fact that everyone was not knit together in the way that they thought, right? There were ethnic divisions and tribalism, right? Um, you had elites and subalterns, right? Um, and so South Sudan actually explodes into its own civil war. Oh, in wow. 2013, right? Between the largest ethnic group, the the um, the Dinka, and the second largest ethnic group, the Nur, right? And these kind of oh, ethnic wow. differences were um, even made more violent because, of course, the president was Dinka, the vice president was Nur. Oh my goodness! Um, and so you have a five-year conflict. Famine, thousands of people dead, refugee crisis, you know, all of the kind of accoutrement, if you will, of modern civil conflicts, right? Um, what a terrible conflict. twist. Yes. Yeah. And it's one that I was in grad school during this time. So imagine writing your PhD dissertation in, you know, 2012, 2013, <laughs> expecting a kind of, you know, happily ever after. And then as you're writing your last <laughs> chapter, oh, no, you know, like everything that. So um, I literally had to um, the fifth chapter of my book would have been impossible if, if I had, you know, completed it in, you know, mid 2013. Right. So th this is kind of one of those examples where, you know, writing history can be really tough when the history is still evolving right in, like, in ways that you would not have imagined <laughs> otherwise exactly right like you know like like imagine someone writing um the history of you know i don't know the civil right or someone writing the history of black lives matter and then 2020 happens Pandemic, yeah. yeah. And like the yeah. whole thing would be. So it just changes as well. That's wow. kind of what happened. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Let's take a break here. Stay with me and Dr. Townsville as we get into the perspective.